Well, good morning or afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the NAI Director's Seminar for this month. I am really, really pleased that Giovanna Tinetti is here. She's actually here with us in the video conference room at NAI Central. I think all of you know that the second bullet in NAI's mission statement is to train the next generation of astrobiologists. And Giovanna Tinetti has got to be our poster child, so to speak, uh, in that regard. Giovanna was a particle physicist at the University of Torino. Uh, she got her bachelor's degree in particle physics at Torino and learned about all this wonderful stuff that was going on in understanding habitable environments on other planets and uh, in uh, understanding the nature of life on Earth and bringing all of these fields together. She did a PhD at the University of Torino in the uh, Department of Physics, but her thesis title was Energy and Entropy for Extraterrestrial Life. And she contacted uh, Ken Nielsen, who was uh, one of our uh, new PIs, as well as uh, a couple of our other new PIs, uh, around year 2000, and wound up coming over and joining Ken Nielsen's team, and then joining Vicki Meadows' team when VPL was selected to join the Institute in CAN2. And I think all we can say is that the rest is history. Giovanna has since been making headlines with some of her work on observations of extrasolar planets, particularly using the Spitzer Space Telescope. And she was uh, chosen the best young Italian physicist in the, in the entire nation, won award in 1999, and is now a researcher at University College London and also working with the European Space Agency. And so we proudly claim Giovanna as one of our own, and we're going to hear from her today about her work on extrasolar planets. Her title is Observing Extrasolar Worlds from Gas Giant to Terrestrial Planets. And I give you Giovanna Tinetti. Well, thank you so much, Carl. I mean, uh, this, uh, this welcoming is uh, probably even too warm. <laughs> I was moved by your words. Uh, thank you so much for having invited me here. It's a really great pleasure and a great honor to give this seminar. And uh, I made the, the sort of selection uh, today to talk more about what we know now about Exosol Planet and just leave the um, few uh, minutes in the end to talk about perspective. Be because I really think that we already can say a lot of things, what we have, we have discovered most recently and what we are doing really today about this field. This field is very recent because uh, we have just to go back to 1995 uh, to find that uh, the first extrasolar planet orbiting a uh, um, uh, 51 Pegasi was discovered by the Geneva group uh, um, of uh, Mayo and Knotts, and it was confirmed by the group of Marcy and Bather soon after. So it's a very recent uh, field. and. Uh, since then, actually, I put here 280, and I discovered this morning that actually the exact number is uh, 294, so we are approaching the 300. It's just that you miss one day, basically, the number is going up. And actually, I've seen this morning that um, there was the announcement of a new planet of 3.3 her masses by Michael Lansing. Uh, so uh, congratulations to the team who did that, but uh, you can see that not only the number is increasing, uh, Thanks, uh, thanks God, the mass is decreasing, so we are really approaching uh, the hurry size uh, uh, planets. Uh, now, not only extrasolar planets in general are extremely important to be detected and discovered, but uh, certainly from a point of view, especially of availability, we really would like to know um, how they are formed and uh, how they evolved and uh, what are their characteristics. So the entire idea is actually to not only to detect them, but also to characterize them. And for planets that are transiting and their parent star, actually, we can certainly do uh, a lot of things right now and uh, get a lot of information out of the uh, observations. Uh, why having a transiting planet is important? Well, it's important because if you can couple uh, the idea of the transit with the radio velocity measurement, you can get the mass from the radio velocity and then the radius from the transit. 
And so you can infer the density of the planet. And from the density, you can really start to think uh, what is the internal structure. It is a terrestrial planet, or is a gas giant, or is a Neptune planet. And uh, there are already several groups, both in Europe and in the US, that uh, right now are exploring uh, this um, uh, very interesting field, trying to understand if just looking at the uh, radius versus mass diagram, you can really infer uh, some of their internal properties. So I put here a graph that is coming uh, from the group of Sotain and Grassein, Nantes in particular, uh, but there are um, several other models, very similar, by Forney, uh, by Sarah Seeger. And the idea is that, at least for the planet in our solar system, uh, just looking at a diagram like that, you can already uh, do a um, uh, very big division between the terrestrial planet that are, form, uh, that are composed more of silicate and rock, uh, like uh, Earth, Venus, and Mars, or the planet that contains uh, actually um, a non-negligible amount of ice. And so the ratio between the radius and the mass is, uh, is definitely different, and you can see that in this particular diagram. But then people have thought also more exotic work, uh, like the carbon planet that were proposed by Kushner and Seeger. And uh, we have probably to have much more statistics to understand if they're real or, or if they're just plausible. Okay, um, I told you that the field of exosoplanet is brand new, but the field of, of transit is even uh, more new. And this is because the first primary transit, the first uh, transit uh, um, for an exosoplanet was observed by the group of Charbonneau and his team. And uh, basically what they did in 2000 was to measure the flux of the star and then measure the dimming of this flux when the planet is basically passing in front of it. And so this technique is called the primary transit. And the entire idea is that by measuring the dimming, uh, first of all, uh, you can infer uh, basically the radius of the planet with respect to the radius of the star. And just to give you an idea, if you're talking about a gas giant planet uh, that is transiting a G-type of star, like our own sun, here we're talking about 1%, more or less. This ratio of surfaces is about 1%. And of course, this ratio is changing depending if the planet is smaller or bigger, or, but also the type of the star. Um, but n not only this is extremely important, um, you can also derive with transiting planet a lot of the parameters, uh, orbital parameters, so not only um, planetary parameters. But also what I'm particularly interested in, a lot of people are, are extremely interested in, is that um, for some of these objects, uh, usually the, the biggest one at the moment, but of course the techniques are, are getting better and better, you can also probe basically the atmosphere, and in this case would be an annulus, so the limb of the planet. And uh, just to give you an idea of how, how small is this quantity, we're talking about uh, a number which is more or less 0.1%. Of course, this number is changing depending on which wavelength you're concentrating in. But this is just, again, a ballpark to give you an impression. So it's very tiny compared to the 1%. Uh, but we can already now uh, probe this sort of uh, um, numbers. So, in order to really uh, understand what is going on in the atmosphere of this solar planet using this type of technique, primary transit, uh, there were several papers uh, coming out, theoretical papers. And one of the, uh, I would say, the pioneer benchmark paper is the Seeger and Sassilo in 2000. They proposed for the first time to use this technique to specifically uh, probe the atmosphere on an exosolar planet. And they were more concentrating in simulation in the UV and the visible. And this is because in, in those years, uh, Hubble uh, was uh, uh, very popular. And so that was the uh, um, obvious starting point from a point of view of observations. Uh, another bench my paper uh, is the Brown 2001. Uh, he modeled the spectrum transmission uh, in the visible and near infrared, a uh, great paper. And uh, I most recently looked into the possibility of applying this primary transit technique in the middle infrared. And the reason for doing so is that uh, Spitzer uh, was, uh, was actually working um, and, uh, and very well. 
And also in the middle infrared, then you can actually probe uh, uh, some of the molecules that not necessarily are obviously detectable in the visible part of the spectrum. But there is a complementary technique to the one that I just showed to you. It's a so-called secondary transit technique. And here the idea is you're uh, looking at the flux of the star and the planet together. So you take together the package, star and planet, and then you wait for the planet to be hidden by the star. And so, as you can imagine, the, the, the star flux, planet flux is dimmed at this point, and you can subtract the contribution of the star. So in this way, you're sort of probing photons, light, which is uh, directly emitted or reflected by the planet. Uh, so because of this, uh, uh, the technique is really complementary to the, to the um, primary transit, where you're looking basically um, at, a at, a, um, at a spectrum that is uh, transmitted. Um, of course, depending on the wavelength, uh, we are using for doing this sort of observation, uh, the kind of information we can, uh, we can have is very different. So if we do secondary transit and the visible uh, part of the spectrum, we can certainly probe um, the albedo of the planet because uh, uh, in the visible is where we have, a, uh, we can probe all the multiple scattering. Um, and uh, um, if there are clouds, probably, uh, the albedo should change. Um, if we are basically applying this technique in the infrared part of the spectrum, uh, then you're looking at light that is emitted directly by the planet. And so basically you can probe above the, the presence of molecules absorbing in the atmosphere and having some transition in the infrared part of the spectrum. But you can also have a, um, a very good probe of the thermal structure of the atmosphere. And this is because, uh, again, in emission spectroscopy and in infrared, uh, you definitely can probe these sort of quantities. Uh, up till now, the, uh, the planets we have, uh, we have been able to, to follow with this technique in terms of atmospheric characterization uh, are especially hot Jupiters. So it's a new class of object uh, that before we discover exosolar planet, we were unaware they could exist. Uh, certainly they are not present in our solar system. And the reason they are so popular in terms of uh, observation uh, is because, uh, uh, well, they are gas giant planet orbiting very close to the star, so the temperature can be very high, meaning that also uh, the atmosphere is very extended, and all these characteristics makes them an excellent target to be probed with a transit technique. We believe that uh, most of them, or at least uh, uh, some of them, are tidally locked. Uh, probably not all of them. Uh, but also, we don't know right now, even for those that might be tidally locked, uh, how deep uh, can be the tidal lock with the planet. And uh, this information could help out actually understanding better the dynamics of these atmospheres. So, uh, hot Jupiter were probed at the beginning, a few years ago, uh, especially in the, view, in the UV and visible part of the spectrum, using Hubble and most uh, telescope. And if you look in those wavelengths, you can probe uh, atomic species, ion species, uh, the presence of clouds or hazes, uh, uh, and more in general, really probing the upper atmosphere. Uh, so the boundary conditions. And uh, definitely this sort of information is extremely useful uh, for all the models in 3D that absolutely need this, uh, uh, this information to, to be able to, um, to be more, um, um, to be improved. The first uh, measurement of uh, um, an atmospheric component uh, in an extrasolar planet was done again by Charbonneau in 2002. And uh, it looked at uh, um, the planet called so-called HD 209458b. Unfortunately, this planet have an unpronounceable name. And uh, he used uh, the instrument STIS on board our Hubble. And he looked at the line of sodium. And it could definitely detect uh, an absorption in those lines, about 0.02%. was changing a little bit, this number, depending how close to this, uh, the, mm, the center of the line it was a probing. 
And uh, basically similar observations were repeated uh, more recently from the ground. Actually, the first ground-based observation and the first ground-based detection of an atmospheric component was done last year by the group of Redfield et al. And this time, the sodium was found on another planet uh, of Jupiter, HD 19733b. And it turns out it actually looks like sodium is three times more abundant on this particular planet rather than the one probed by Charbonneau. Uh, more measurement from the ground uh, confirming um, what uh, Charbonneau uh, probed in 2002. And then there is an entire literature actually already trying to explain uh, immediately after the observation, but also uh, most recently, um, why there was so little sodium or why there is so much sodium in this case for the other planet. And there are several explanations. Um, what I, I personally like a lot is the one given by Atria just last year, where it, it sort of um, proposed that actually sodium might be uh, um, due to post-accretionary source. So basically getting into the atmosphere, not uh, as an original source, but after, uh, from debris and meteorites and comets. And that could explain why we're seeing this sort of variability. Uh, we have only two planets at the moment having this, uh, this uh, particular signature, but we hope that we can probe more planets and understand a little bit more what is going on. Another very important observation in this field there was the one uh, done uh, uh, looking at the Lehman Alpha line, hydrogen line, and uh, in the UV part of the spectrum. And this was done by the group of Vidal Majari in Paris in 2003. And uh, the group measured a huge absorption in this line. We're talking about 15%. It's enormous. It means that actually it's more than the planetary radius. Um, more recently, there was a reduction of the data, and this number seems to be a little bit less, but still, we're talking about 9%. It's still huge number. So this is telling us that something is going on, uh, and uh, one of the explanations of the, that was given originally by the group that made the observation was that the entire planet was evaporating and there was hydrogen escape um, um, in the upper atmosphere of the planet. Uh, there are several models that follow the, um, that prediction, and uh, the most recent one are uh, Koskinen et al. 2008. They propose a 3D model uh, of the upper atmosphere of a gas giant planet, have tributaries, and uh, they propose, uh, they actually uh, could um, uh, see that uh, this particular planet, the one observed, is certainly in the condition of instability so potentially could evaporate, and potentially there could be hydrogen escape in the upper atmosphere. What we don't know right now is uh, if this planet has a magnetic field or not, because uh, in that case, uh, the, what is inferred by modeling could change a lot. Um, another explanation that was given by another group, Holmstrom et al., another nature paper, so this observation keeps actually providing nature paper, as you can see. Um, is that actually uh, the observation was probing the stellar wind, so not necessarily the upper atmosphere of the planet, but uh, actually a much more complex situation where you have a combination of stellar wind, upper part of the plan upper atmosphere of the planet, and certainly if there is a magnetic field, all the situation can be extremely complex. So I think we definitely would like to see more observation of this type on, on um, different hot Jupiters to see uh, exactly uh, what is going on. Unfortunately, the instrument this on board of Hubble is no longer working, and uh, people try to use another instrument on board of Hubble, ACS, looking at visible or near UV part of the spectrum. And uh, I'm showing you here basically a couple of papers that came out, uh, the one Knudsen et al. and Pon et al. Um, using ACS for two different planets. And uh, unfortunately, ACS uh, spectral resolution is not good enough for the visible UV part of the spectrum. And this is because if you're expecting to find uh, all these um, um, sodium, metassium, uh, potassium line, so alkali metal lines, they all have this uh, uh, very narrow signature. And so if you start to dilute the resolution, instead of seeing 
this very nice peak, you see just a, a bump. And so, uh, for instance, with ACS, you're not able to confirm measurement that we're already done with this. Um, there seems also uh, to be, uh, I mean, ACS seems to suggest that also water and clouds is present. Um, and this is because clouds and haze is because this spectra seems to be pretty flat in the visible. So it looks like you have some sort of opacities that is not allowing you to see very deep in the atmosphere. But then it's all suggested because, uh, again, the resolution is not really high enough to uh, be very conclusive. A uh, very nice contribution was given by most of satellites. Uh, they looked at um, Jupiter planet, Jupiter-like planet, hot Jupiters, uh, in the visible, uh, with visible broadband photometry. So they really look at the sort of entire chunk of the visible spectrum. And in particular, they concentrated in uh, two uh, different planets. And uh, for one of them, HD 209458b, they could measure using secondary transit technique, the albedo. And the albedo seems to be extremely low, something less than point, uh, 25. And uh, again, this number is extremely low, especially if compared with the planet we know in our solar system, gas giant or Titan. So it really looks like very reflective clouds are ruled out uh, because of this measurement. Uh, let me bring you now into the infrared part of the spectrum and the Spitzer and Nikmos here. Era. Uh, NIGMOS is another instrument aboard the Hubble, but is probing uh, in the near infrared part of the spectrum. Now, if you, uh, if you are in the infrared, you can definitely observe um, and detect like a species. Uh, you can have an idea of what is going on about thermal profile and thermal structures. Uh, so you have an idea of what is going on of these very complex dynamics of these planetary atmospheres. And potentially, you could probe clouds and hazes, even though for the moment we don't have uh, too many um, detection of those. More in general, with respect to what you're doing in the UV and visible, you're really probing much deeper in the atmosphere of a planet. A uh, very nice result, uh, the light curve uh, uh, probed by the group of Natsun et al. Uh, in 2007 and even more recently, at A micron and 24 micron. Basically what they did was to follow the planet uh, during its orbit and so measuring it from primary to secondary. And by following this planet in its light curve, they could probe that, that uh, the bulk temperature uh, is actually, uh, seems to be very well mixed in this particular planet, which is uh, HD 189. So it looks like uh, the dynamics is efficient enough uh, to sort of mix the day side and the night side of the planet. And this is situation is uh, very different from the one uh, on the contrary probe by another group, Arrington et al., a very, another very nice paper. And uh, they look at Hoopsilon Andromeda. This is actually a planet that doesn't transit. Uh, so that can give you an idea of how powerful this technique can be. You don't need necessarily a transit. But the planet is basically orbiting close enough to the star and uh, is hot enough to be able to be probed uh, with Spitzer. And uh, it looks like this particular planet, on the contrary, is showing a huge gradient of temperature between uh, uh, day and night. So again, two different planets that are probed and very different answers. So we're already seeing a lot of variabilities in this object. So we probably should be careful in just classifying them as a, just one box of things. But what I would like to discuss a little bit more today with you is uh, uh, the new direction that all this field is, is, uh, is bringing in. Uh, from photochemical models, what we knew a few years, a few years ago, uh, especially from the works of Liang et al. in 2003 and 2004, was that uh, the, if, if the carbon versus oxygen ratio is more or less equal solar for this planet, which is a reasonable assumption if you don't know better this number, then actually you should expect to have water in a non-negligible quantity uh, in these hot tributaries. And uh, 10 minus 4 is definitely uh, kind of abundant, is more or less the same quantity we have on Earth of water when you are above the clouds. 
And uh, according to these models, for this hot Jupiter, we should have expect a lot of CO, uh, almost abundant as water. And this is because they're very hot environment and carbon bearing species uh, seems to go more towards the CO side rather than the methane side. And uh, also because methane in the, in the upper atmosphere on this planet is supposed to be photolyzed very efficiently because of this very huge irradiation. And then these were the models. Then um, there were several attempts actually to uh, try to probe really the presence of water and to confirm these models. And um, today I'm, I'm telling you about what we, we did in the, in the infrared part of the spectrum. The entire idea was to use a primary transit technique, uh, but in the infrared, and basically to look at this planet while it was transiting, and uh, we used uh, basically three different bands, three different Spitzer bands. Um, and uh, what, what turned out uh, is that uh, the planet seems to be much larger, a 5.8 rather than a 3.6 meaning that, of course, this effect here is magnified, just to show you uh, the behavior. But the entire idea is that uh, mm, possibly something is absorbing much more efficiently at 5.8 microns, so that's why the planet is much larger. And this is because the light is basically blocked at an higher level of the atmosphere, so it looks larger. On the contrary, at 3.6, uh, what's happened is since uh, the atmosphere seems to be much more transparent, so that's why the, the planet looks much smaller, and this is because the light can really probe much deeper. And then if you put these uh, three measurements uh, um, as a function of, of wavelength, and uh, you look at this, uh, at this result, actually you might think that a lot of molecule, a lot of situation might explain these three bands, but actually the most obvious one is to uh, to think that water is absorbing, because water is able really to explain very well this, uh, uh, this behavior. Of course, the uh, three bands are almost enough to tell you that water is there, but certainly there is not only water, and you can imagine that there is something else. Is that, that with uh, broadband photometry, you are not able to be sensitive to the something else. So what we did actually was to look at the same planet and to use another instrument, NICMUS this time, Hubble instrument. And uh, in the near infrared, uh, uh, we could get much more points actually, are the black one. And uh, all these points are telling us that water is certainly explaining part of the behavior and the modulation. But it's not, ne it's not able to explain all of the story. And uh, after a lot of um, uh, tries, we could find that methane could actually explain very well. And uh, I just told you that methane was supposed to be negligible on this planet, uh, but what we found was actually that it was not negligible at all. Uh, so what can be the explanation? Well, first of all, uh, here we are in a measurement in primary transit, meaning that we're looking at the terminator. The terminator is this line that is dividing the night side from the day side. And so most probably we are very sensitive to what is going on on the night side of this planet. So at the night side of this planet, the temperature can uh, potentially drop, and this is, comes out from our observations, uh, to 900, 800. So these are temperature for which methane can start to be an important species uh, with respect to CO. And uh, also the fact that the night side is not irradiated like the day side, uh, probably methane is not so efficiently uh, destroyed. Uh, this is just putting together the uh, measurements in the near infrared and the middle infrared, and uh, the agreement is actually very good. And it was also a little bit of surprise because here we're using two different instruments, and. Uh, while the three measurements in the middle infrared and separately the one in near infrared were done simultaneously, middle infrared and near infrared were not done simultaneously. So we were expecting a few more efforts uh, to play, but um, they didn't seem to be very important. Now, I'll show you before very briefly that one of the measurements in the visible uh, by uh, Pon et al. Uh, showed a spectra that were much more flat, 
and so suggesting that we're hazes in the uh, uh, in the upper atmosphere of this planet. Um, what type of hazes? How are these? Uh, uh, how are the characteristic of these particular clouds or hazes in this planet? So how big are these particles, how they are distributed? It's something that we'll, we would like to follow up, and, uh, but in order to do so, we need more measurement uh, between uh, 1 and uh, more or less uh, 1.6 micron, which is exactly the, the area that at the moment is not probed, because we, we would like to see this passage between uh, the part that is opaque before a vases and the part that is completely transparent. And I put here a very blurred, unfortunately, uh, figure that was taken from round 2001. is as blurred as is probably uh, if you look in the visible and atmosphere through some hazes. Uh, but this got, just gives you the idea that if you play around with the particle size parameter, you can get more than one situation. And so we really need to have a little bit more data to understand what is going on. Um, another planet that was particularly interesting was, uh, interesting was HD 209. And uh, this planet uh, seems to show an emission, a temperature inversion. And again, are a few of the planets we are probing right now, but we are already showing a lot of variability. Let me come back to HD 29, my favorite planet. And uh, there were new measurements coming out this year by the group of Charbonneau and the Newton and Barman. And this is the, the day side of the planet. So what we did when we tried to uh, um, detect water and methane, we were probing the Terminator and the night side. Here is a spectrum emission, and they use a secondary transit photometry to do so. And they're looking more at the day side. And uh, just from the photometry, it looks like, well, water is there confirmed. Uh, but this seems to suggest that CO is, is present there. And the reason they say so is very reasonable, because at 4.5 micron, uh, the, the photometry is actually a little bit lower than you would expect if CO were not there. What I can anticipate you is that after, uh, after those papers, we put together more observation, always for the day side of this particular planet, and we put together observation and uh, um, emission, uh, always using uh, NICMOS, so near-infrared, other measurements uh, uh, in spectroscopy in the middle-infrared, and putting everything together. Um, we have uh, now um, a new scenario that seems to suggest that definitely the day side of the planet is very different from the night side. And it looks like in the day side of the planet, photochemistry play really a major role. So it's, it's really going along the prediction, uh, the photochemical prediction of models of a few years ago. And uh, this is an anticipation. I'm sorry that I cannot show you the, the spectrum just because it's very nice to meet you to nature. So we have to be a little bit careful. But um, we seem to, to have a strong suggestion that CO2 is there and possibly HCN. So there will be more stuff. Uh, come in uh, very soon, I hope. So what's next? Because I just show you uh, interesting planets, but probably not that interesting in terms of habitability. These are hells, so certainly life, uh, uh, I guess, uh, is not very happy to live on hot Jupiters. So what next is to try to use the same kind of technique and uh, what we are learning right now on these hot Jupiters to choose smaller size planets. And what we can do right now today is a Neptune-sized planet, for instance. Gliese 436b has already been probed uh, uh, with Spitzer by the group of Deming, and I can tell you that there are several observations that were uh, given to different groups uh, uh, to probe this planet in every possible way with every possible instrument. So in a few months we will know a lot about what is going on, at least on one example of half Neptunes. Uh, further into the future, unfortunately, probably Spitza will, um, uh, will lose his uh, cryogenic uh, capability, and so um, Warren Spitzer probably uh, will stay alive. And with Warren Spitzer, we, we uh, will be able to still use uh, part of the IRA camera, the band of 3.6 and 4.5 are still okay even for Warren Spitzer. So this is definitely a telescope we are not losing for the moment, which is great. 
further into the future, we will have this new generation of space telescopes, the James uh, Webb Space Telescope in particular. And right now, there are several groups that are already making simulation and calculation to see what we can do with this uh, fantastic toy. And uh, I can tell you that, at least in primary transit, we can already do Earth-sized planet. And uh, this is part of uh, work we are doing with uh, Anthony Boccaletti in Paris and uh, his student, uh, Carroc. And there are many other groups that are doing similar calculation and uh, also looking into the possibility of looking at um, super Earth uh, doing secondary transit with JWST. JWST will have an incredible sensitivity, so uh, we are definitely able to probe uh, more interesting planets that are more interesting in terms of observability. Another interesting instrument um, that might help us if, it's, uh, if it will be launched is a JAXA is a mission called Spica. It's a sort of new generation of a Spitzer. And uh, it will be cooled at 5 Kelvin. And so this could provide a very high sensitivity and very high spectral resolution. Uh, Japanese are um, trying to see if they can put a coronagraph on one of the instruments. So potentially, they could also do a little bit of uh, direct detection. So very interesting instrument. So to conclude about the part about primary and secondary transit technique using both photometry and spectroscopy, this technique are probably to, to be extremely powerful because, uh, I mean, uh, I just show you a most recent result using this technique and how many things we could do um, using those methods. And uh, something that I realized actually putting together uh, a similar talk for the Boston meeting on transit in planet last week was actually we are already approaching the level of knowledge that uh, uh, was uh, reached uh, with Voyager 1 for the solar system. The kind of question we are asking right now, the kind of detection we are doing, is not that, that different from those years. So I really think that the extrasolar planet field has really reached uh, an, an, an extremely uh, high level um, of sophistication at the moment. And certainly, e even if I told you that um, using transit uh, spectroscopy and photometry technique is wonderful because you can do a lot of things, certainly for planets with larger separation from the stars, so they're not orbiting very close, uh, they are not so practical. And for those planets, definitely you need to think in terms of direct detection. And so this is more a message for the, for the future that we all hope uh, will be a near future. So the idea with direct detection is that you, you try to uh, take out the contribution of the star and concentrate on the planet alone. Uh, on the contrary, with transit technique, you always have to put together the package star and planet. So it's a, it's a sort of different way of thinking. Uh, direct detection is obviously not easy, and that's why it's taken a little bit of time uh, to be implemented, because uh, if you look at the planet in the visible or in the infrared, uh, for each photon that is coming out of your planet, you need to get rid of 10 power 9 or 10 power 6 photons, depending which whale you're looking at and what is the size of the planet. But these numbers are big, and so definitely the, the techniques are there, but um, uh, it's certainly not an easy, an easy job. There are the law, at the moment a lot of mission concepts that are considered for studies, both in the US uh, or in Europe, uh, using, for instance, a uh, uh, more or less big size telescope and uh, coronagraphs. Um, if you use a small size a telescope, definitely you're not able to do a uh, Earth size planet. You are at most able to do super Earth. But there are also new concepts that, uh, on the contrary, are probably more uh, planned to do a really Earth-sized planet in the habitable zone. One of those is the New World Observer, the mission that was proposed by Wester Cash. And uh, this is certainly a large class uh, exoplanet mission. And the entire idea is that uh, you have a, a deployable mask uh, that is occulting uh, and uh, the star shade is separated by the telescope. 
And uh, with this kind of technique uh, um, from simulation, uh, you can see this, these are basically a simulation of our own solar system, how you would uh, detect it uh, if you were 10 parsecs away. And uh, as you can see from the simulation, uh, with a four meter telescope, you could potentially be able to probe uh, Earth and Venus. Uh, these are the, uh, basically the, the planets slightly blue and slightly white that you see uh, in the figure here. Uh, also from the ground, there are several efforts in terms of uh, building new instruments and very large telescope and a technique to separate the light of the star and the planet. I'm just citing this uh, initiative from ESO, but I'm sure also in the, in the US there is a similar initiative, it's just that I'm, I'm not completely aware of that. And uh, for instance, um, uh, ESO uh, is planning this extremely large telescope, which at the moment is about uh, 32 meter diameter. And uh, the idea is to implement some extreme adaptive optics to get rid of some of the contribution of the Earth atmosphere and uh, uh, using uh, um, probably coronagraphy and uh, also polarimetry uh, to characterize uh, um, extrasolar planet up to the Earth size uh, level. So let me close uh, my seminar here. I would first of all would like to thank you all uh, for uh, having participated and uh, I would like to thank also uh, my collaborator because uh, Certainly, they are the ones that are doing the tough job in, in reducing most of the data. Uh, and uh, I would like to leave, uh, on the contrary, more time for questions, uh, if you have any. And uh, before uh, I give you the, I pass you the floor, uh, an announcement. We are planning this meeting in, in Paris. Uh, the title will be Molecule in the Atmosphere Exosol Planets. And the idea is to bring together different communities, exosolar planet community, but also the solar system community, brown dwarf astrobiology um, uh, instrument community. And the idea uh, would be to share information, but also to see a little bit more clear how bright can be our future in this field. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Giovanna, for a great seminar. Uh, would anybody who has questions please raise their hand in WebEx? And I'll give you a couple of minutes to do that, and I'll just take advantage of this moment for another announcement, and that is that we will probably have one more director seminar this year before the director seminar goes on vacation for the summer. And uh, I don't think we've confirmed the speaker for the uh, final one, but it will be on Monday, June 30th. If I have that date correct. Yeah, Monday, June 30th. And then the uh, director seminar series will pick up again in September, at the end of September, with Norm Sleep uh, picking up with this very topic and telling us about the habitability of super-Earths. And I'll take advantage of having the floor and the open microphone for the moment to ask Giovanna a question. I found your mass radius chart. It was like the third uh, slide that you showed. Very interesting. One of the challenges, of course, is going to be to tell the difference between a five-Earth mass super-Earth and a five-Earth mass miniature Neptune. How, do, how easily do you think or how hard do you think it's going to be to tell the difference between those two? Will the mass radius relationship be the key? Do you think the molecular species in the atmosphere will be the key? And, and how well do you think the tools we're going to have, let's say, in the next five, ten years to approach that question, uh, how effective do you think they're going to be? Well, this is a very good question, actually. Uh, well, first of all, since we are assuming that we know the mass and the radius, we are probably also assuming we're looking at a transiting planet. So let's let, let put us in the situation that, uh, in the easiest situation. So uh, I would say we can definitely uh, understand if it is a, a terrestrial rocky planet or an Neptune planet just by uh, using primary transit technique uh, for the atmosphere. 
So if you have a telescope like Hubble or Spitzer, for instance, or next generation of space telescope for which we can reach that level of detail, definitely we can see what is going on because if it is a Neptune uh, planet, uh, what we imagine is that Neptune planet is, uh, is uh, made of a lot of hydrogen still, so meaning with that that the atmosphere is still very extended. And so what I'm expecting is that from an atmospheric point of view in transmission, you can really get a very nice signature of what is going on. On the contrary, if you have a rocky planet of that mass in primary transit, I'm predicting that you're not seeing anything. And the reason for this is that in primary transit technique, uh, what is happening, since you're really probing an atmosphere and you need something very extended for that, uh, for a rocky planet, the atmosphere is supposed to be much more compact. And so I guess that at that level, uh, looking just at, at the presence of signatures or non-signature from the atmospheres will tell you the answer. Okay, we have a question from Tom Green. Hello. Um, I'd, I'd like to uh, second, uh, I guess, uh, Carl's comments about this really being an excellent talk. Um, just a minor comment is that uh, I certainly agree JWST is going to be a very powerful observatory for this, and it will have some good capabilities. We think that uh, we'll be able to get uh, pretty high-quality spectra, like better than IRS and hopefully better than NICMOS, from, uh, let's say, at least 2.5 microns out to, oh, at least 13 microns, and, uh, you know, and maybe spectra on, on both sides of that as well. However, um, you know, the instrument teams have been looking into this, and uh, uh, it's probably not going to be getting secondary uh, eclipse spectra of anything uh, close to an Earth size, even, even uh, around an M star. But for larger planets, it's going to do really well. So that was uh, just a comment. Actually, we could do uh, uh, Earth-sized planets around small stars, but they'd be much warmer than uh, ones in habitable zones. So uh, that's, that's the only comment. No, I agree. Uh, when I was talking about her size, I was talking about primary transit, not really secondary. Uh, yeah, right. We may be able to get some. Yeah. I mean, of course, it depends also on the brightness of the star. We're definitely talking about a most favorable uh, target, not for all of them. Mm -hmm. But uh, it seems to be the numbers are there if we, if we have a favorable target. Any other questions? If there are no other hands raised on WebEx, so if you have a question, we'd like to just jump in. This is an opportunity. Okay. Um, uh, I, there's a question of Goddard. Yes, Go ahead, Goddard. Um, I had a question about your um, CO and water measurements and, and methane measurements. I don't know if you if your uh, abundances or, or or errors are small enough to get a C to O ratio that is meaningful out of those observations and how it compares to our own system or, or other, um, other uh, interstellar values that we know of for pseudo ratios? Uh, that's a very good question. This was exactly what, where we wanted to go uh, somehow. Now, in, uh, from the measurements in primary transit, and in particular uh, from the observation of NICMOS in primary, uh, it was actually tough to give a CO ratio, uh, and the, the reason for that is that uh, the, the signature of methane could potentially mask the presence of the signature of CO. And so we could uh, set an upper limit on the CO abundance, but just an upper limit. So at the moment, uh, on, uh, in primary, meaning, that, uh, meaning with that, the termination and potentially an eye side, we are not able really to to set a limit on the CO ratio. But what I can uh, sort of can anticipate to you is that this new paper that we submitted for uh, the emission uh, spectrum day, on the day side, since uh, in that case we were able to um, put together a lot of measurement from the near uh, infrared to the far infrared and uh, also in spectroscopy, in that case, uh, we could be a little bit more specific. And uh, there seems to be indication, and again, take it for the moment as a preliminary thing because uh, paper is being ref the paper is being refereed at the moment. But it really looks like um, for um, interpreting well the, spectra, the spectrum in the mission, 
you need to have a zero ratio that seems to go uh, towards the carbon enrichment. So on, on emission, we were able to be a little bit more specific, and especially because there were species like CO2 that can be used as a proxy of the presence of CO. How large were the uncertainties on that? I mean, was it within Earth, uh, within solar range, or or far or beyond that in two sigma, three sigma levels? Well, again, uh, I would be just a little bit careful because, of course, there are arrow bars. So uh, I, I mean, probably not very comfortable in setting in a number. I'm just telling you, is it, there is a very strong suggestion that uh, there is a carbon enrichment. Okay. I would just stay with that. Thank you. Question at Colorado. Hi. Um, you talked about primary and secondary transits, and I was just wondering, when you observe a transit, how can you tell which type of transit you're observing? Uh, well, well, basically, when you plan your observation, uh, you, you plan exactly what you're doing. Um, so uh, in the case, again, of, of primary, uh, you basically observe uh, uh, basically when the planet is passing in front of the star. And so you measure before when there is no transit, so there is the, the sort of star alone, and then when the planet is passing in front of it. And the case of secondary, you have to plan your observation in a different way. So you, you, you plan those. Do we have any other questions? Any here in NAI Central? Well, if there are no further questions, let's thank our speaker again. Okay, see you all on June 30th, and uh, be careful out there. <laughs>